Good afternoon, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Mark Zitter, chair of the Zetima Project, a member of the club's board of governors, and your moderator for today. I'm pleased to bring you this program, which is the first in a series of virtual sessions we'll be hosting here at the club on the coronavirus and COVID-19. You can see more about that series if you go to commonwealthclub.org. These programs are free. However, we would be delighted if you would also go to our homepage and support the programs and the club with your donations. A special thank you to those of you who have already made such a donation. We are the nation's oldest and largest public affairs forum, and it's a not-for-profit that generates its revenues through events. You can imagine how much we appreciate you during these difficult times. And they are difficult times. Today is March 18th, 2020. We are living in an historic time. The coronavirus and the disease it causes, COVID-19, are spreading rapidly and have changed life as we know it, and this seems to occur on a daily basis. My wife is a hospital-based physician, and as such, she's usually a day or two ahead of me in thinking about this, and what I found is each time she suggests something as a restriction, it seems a bit extreme, but by the next day, it seems utterly rational. We also found uh, just on Sunday, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommended that we limit gatherings to only 50 people, no more than 50, but by the very next day, the White House, which has been criticized for not being aggressive enough in its response, lowered that number from 50 to 10. That same day, Monday, California, uh, in its, the Bay Area, issued a sheltering in place mandate for everyone except those with essential jobs. And as most of you know, most California public school students, most employees are staying at home. Then yesterday, Governor Gavin Newsom said that we should be prepared for public schools to stay closed for the rest of the academic year. Most colleges have already made that decision with graduations canceled or postponed. The stock market has dropped by more than 30% last I checked. Companies are already laying off some workers and the impact on our personal finances is still unknown but likely to be profound. And of course, all the while the virus continues to spread. Uh, as of today, and I just checked, we have about 7,500 cases of COVID-19 in the United States, though the real number is likely to be far higher because we haven't been testing. And we have more than 100 deaths. And those numbers keep rising dramatically on one of those hockey stick, stick curves that we don't like to see in this kind of a situation. I want to give you just a sense of how fast these numbers are growing. Nearly one-fourth of all the COVID-19 cases in the United States were identified yesterday. Now, some of that may be because we've been testing a lot more recently, more rapidly, but uh, one-fifth of the deaths from the virus, which are less test-dependent, also happened yesterday. That's how fast things are growing. So clearly, it's crucial that we reduce the rate of transmission. A report released Monday by an expert group from London warned that the United States could see 2.2 million deaths if we don't do anything. But if we take aggressive measures, we can cut that in half. That sounds a lot better, but it's still a million deaths. This is obviously quite serious. Now, I'm here by myself in the Toby Family Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club, a room that's usually filled with more than 200 people. I'm trying to model social distancing. Fortunately, I also have with us, virtually, two experts in the coronavirus and COVID-19, and I'm going to introduce you to them right now. We have Dr. John Swartzberg, the Clinical Professor Emeritus at UC Berkeley in the School of Public Health. He's an expert in infectious disease and vaccinology, and also uh, is on the uh, editorial board of the UC Berkeley Wellness Letter and Health After 50. And uh, joining us from the South Bay, Dr. C. Jason Wong, who's an associate professor of pediatrics and the, 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 I'm sorry, the director for the Center for Policy, Outcomes, and Prevention at Stanford University. Dr. Schwartzberg and Dr. Wong, thank you both for joining us today for this special virtual program. So let's really get us started. I'll start with you, John. Uh, and of course, all of us have been hearing a lot about the virus and about how we can try to stay healthy and avoid transmitting the virus to other people. I'd like you to recap the key points on how the virus is spread and what individuals can do to minimize the likelihood of infecting themselves or anybody else. Sure. How it's spread is still, um, still has a lot of questions surrounding it. We think the most important way it's spread is by large and medium-sized droplets droplets coming from somebody's mouth who's infected or their nose if they sneeze. And those, because of their weight relative to the air, usually drop to the ground within about six feet. So we think if you're within that distance, about six feet with somebody who's infected for, for a prolonged period of time, 
you have a good chance of getting infected or you have a chance of getting infected. And we think that's the most important way. There are other ways that perhaps we can talk about as we go along, um, touching objects, uh, what about the role of air and so on. But I think the most important thing is distance from people. Great. And how else can we protect ourselves? Obviously everybody knows by now we should wash our hands often. Is that the other main directive? We think that's also an important way of means of transmission. That is, if somebody was talking in those droplets I was talking about, landed on an inanimate object like a pen, and then someone else picked up that pen, and then from their hands they went to their nose or mouth or eye, they could inoculate it that way. Mm -hmm. We think that's probably not as important as the droplets that I was talking about, but also important. And if someone is simply breathing who's infected, but doesn't sneeze, is the six feet necessary as well? Yes. Okay. Even right. just talking like I'm doing right now can expel particles. Great. What about the symptoms? If I get coronavirus, how will I know if I have it? That's tough. An awful lot of people who get infected with this don't know they have it because they feel absolutely fine. They never get sick, especially children, but we're also seeing that in certainly in adults. Mm -hmm. And if you do get sick, it's often very mild. You might have a cough, you could have some upper respiratory symptoms, although that's a little less typical. Um, and really just go on with your life because you don't think you're very sick at all. Mm -hmm. It's really that smaller group, around 20%, that gets pretty sick. And early on, I'd heard that the main, most common symptoms were a dry cough and some fever. Is that still the case with less, less sneezing oriented than, than a cold would be? Well, if there's anything classical about COVID and we're still not sure whether there is, um, that was certainly the early description of what a classical case would be like. Mm -hmm. A dry cough, not bringing up stuff, fever, severe body aches. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing now lots of very different presentations as well. Some people get very short of breath pretty quickly. Some people, it takes a week of illness before they even get short of breath. Mm -hmm. um, some people get upper respiratory symptomatology. Mm -hmm. Even some people, albeit a small number, get diarrhea with this. So there are myriad ways that patients with this viral infection can get symptomatic. I see. So we know that people can be infected and infectious before they're showing a lot of these symptoms. Um, once they're showing the symptoms, how, how soon are they no longer infectious? Do we know that? Well, not entirely, no. We know we can isolate the virus often, or at least the viral RNA in someone's nose or mouth a few days before they may become symptomatic. We can even find it in people who never become symptomatic. Mm -hmm. And then after someone's been ill, and typically the course may be one or not unusually two weeks for people even moderately ill, mildly to moderately ill, you can still find the, that RNA in their throat or nose up to a few days and even reports of up to three weeks or more. But we don't know the significance of just finding the viral RNA. Mm -hmm. When you're most infectious is when you're very symptomatic. Okay, that's good to know. And then I guess the last question in that series is, let's say I get the disease and I recover from it. Uh, at that point, am I immune? And also, can I go out without worrying about uh, transmitting it to other people at that point? We don't know that either. You're going to hear a lot of me saying, we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a study that was just published uh, looking at macaques, and they develop antibodies that suggest that they're protected. Um, I think most people th believe that we will be protected with antibodies after we get become infected. Mm -hmm. But we don't, even if we are protected, we don't know how long that protection will last. Will it be a month? Will it be a year? Or will it be a lifetime? So these are all questions that we have to find out. Great. Well, I know that we're concerned about how we can slow the spread of the virus. And obviously we're taking some fairly drastic steps there. Uh, Jason, several other countries, including Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, North Korea, have done pretty well containing this virus. And you recently uh, wrote an article, published an article earlier this month in the Journal of the American Medical Association, detailing what Taiwan did successfully. Can you share that with us, please? Sure. Um, I think what Taiwan did was that uh, after SARS in 2003, 
uh, they established a National Health Command Center in 2004 uh, in preparation for the next epidemic. So they were prepared. And the National Health Command Center is a compound that could host 100 people. So what had happened is that uh, very soon uh, after uh, there was signs of an outbreak, they activated the command center and people started to, to work together in the, in the compound 24-7 with data coming in from local governments, from different agencies of government and data analysts analyzing real-time data to inform decision making. And then there's also also press room. So as soon as they find out good information, they release it to the public. And they they held daily press uh, conferences uh, with the experts uh, to tell people, you know, now there's one case and then two cases and where they're coming from. So people have an idea of what they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so this gradual process really build public trust uh, in terms of you know how they are able to respond. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing they did. The second thing they did was that uh, they had taken proactive uh, steps uh, to do case finding. So as early as January 1st, uh, they started to bore on airplanes of people coming from Wuhan mm -hmm. to check for their symptoms and uh, to make sure that they don't have any sort of you know, respiratory illnesses that uh, could uh, be spreading around. And so if they did, they would be under quarantine. So, uh, and others who didn't could actually deplane, but those with symptoms are actually already uh, detected as, as early as January 1st. Wow. Uh, then as they figure out more and more flights coming from China, that they broaden the surveillance areas. And, and so these sort of proactive steps, uh, I think, uh, made a big difference as as well. Um, and, you know, the, the, the third thing they did, uh, I believe, was really use big data and to uh, use new technology. Mm -hmm. And how they did that was that they have a national health insurance data set, which they integrated with the immigration and customs data set. So by doing that, every time somebody goes see a doctor, uh, their travel history will show up. And the doctor will be like, oh, you've been to Wuhan recently. Do you have any cold symptoms? Do you have any fever? They will do more thorough checkups. And then they will uh, put you know, COVID-19 on the differential diagnosis. And, and they have very high sort of alert mm -hmm. uh, for uh, triaging patients at, at that point. Um, and uh, as, as we are finding out now that, for example, airports are not the best place to hang out. So they usually have long lines, right? So the way to avoid the long lines is that they set up a QR code where you kind of scan uh, the QR code and that leads you to an online declaration form for customs. So then they ask you for your travel history, then they ask you for symptoms of a respiratory illness, including fever, hmm. and then they ask you for your contact information. Hmm. So basically, if you are of low risk, you didn't travel to sort of epicenters of the, the outbreak and you have no symptoms, you are ready to go. You just went right through customs. But if you have, uh, uh, if you belong to the high risk group and you travel to level three areas, then you are asked to do home quarantine. And if you have been in contact with people with COVID-19, you do self-isolation, home self-isolation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these, the government really pay attention to this high risk group. And the way they did that is they deliver food when they're under quarantine to their homes. They call them to check up on their symptoms. And if they develop symptoms, the government will help them to get care. So this way people feel like, oh, I'm actually being monitored and for my symptoms because I've been exposed. And they bring me food and they're going to help me. And more recently, they start paying people for those at quarantine, uh, every salary of like a young person per day. So you're actually getting paid to stay home. But if you go outside where you're not supposed to under quarantine, they will issue a big fine. Mm -hmm. So it's both care and stick. They, they pay people to stay in under quarantine. But if you go outside, they will find you. They will get police after you because oh. you're breaking the Communicable Disease Act law. So they have that law in place to do that. Wow. So really quite a full court press overall there too. So you're, a, you're, a, you're not only a doctor, you're a policy expert. 
What do you think we can learn from Taiwan? What could we uh, adopt from the lessons there? And what are we too late to do or just our society won't allow it? So I think there's a, you know, a, a lot of things that we could adapt uh, to our own culture here and our own system here. And so, you know, when we published a list of 124 action items that they did in different categories, you know, individual institutions could do uh, their part in triaging patients, mm -hmm. for example, that, you know, we have the capability to quickly ask people if they've traveled somewhere and to put it in a database, to analyze it, to actually, before they even come to the hospital, to triage them into a different patient uh, flow in the hospital so they are not in contact with people who are really sick, like cancer patients that are immunocompromised. So you really ought to figure this out, individual institutions, uh, individual units within the institution to say, well, here are the patients coming in today and how do we triage them so that they are separate from the very sick patients that are already in the hospital, but we are going to screen them separately and, and get them into a different place. The other thing that institutions could learn is that, um, so right now, uh, a lot of the doctors and nurses, they walk around all over the hospital and they mingle. That's probably not a good idea because if you have one or two people that are infected, they walk around in the cafeteria, they do all this, and then pretty soon the whole hospital, you have to quarantine a whole bunch of healthcare workers. So try to figure out a way to separate different parts of the hospital so if one team is down, your entire system is not that. Mm -hmm. So it's just to, to basically to, to diversify uh, your risk because uh, at this point in time, healthcare resources are extremely valuable. Healthcare personnel are extremely valuable and we need them to be working for us. And what about the differences in the populations? I mean, you know, just a week or two ago, people were saying we can't shut down everything in America. We're not that kind of a country. And yet it feels like in the Bay Area, we're shutting down most everything. And, and people are basically on board because they see the benefits to it. I also heard that in Taiwan at this point, parents will take the child's temperature, every child's temperature before they go to school, text the school before the kid even arrives. The school knows all the kids' temperatures and whether anybody should perhaps be turned back. Um, do you think, what do you think we could do in America where we could pitch in those kind of similar ways? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the game is, um, is really, you know, if we do something in the short term, for example, social distancing, staying at home, uh, and we're going to be able to flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. So what we don't want to do is to have a surge of infections in and everybody rushing to the hospital and, and, and leading to a surge and basically crumble the healthcare system. What we want is that we do social distancing. So the number of people an infected individual could give the virus to mm -hmm. is going to slow down mm -hmm. or at some point going to be less than one. If it's less than one, then means, you know, one person infected giving it to less than one person. That's when I think the infection is going to start to, 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 to really calm down. So we, we have to all do our part, try because you don't know if you're infected. Some people have no symptoms, like Dr. Schwarzberg was saying, you know, that, that you know, you, you, particularly young people, they, they might think, oh, it's time to go out and hang out with friends. It's like a snow day. No, it's not a snow day. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it basically, you know, we, we want people to stay, you know, inside and at home at the, at the moment, for the moment. Okay. OK, and uh, but at this point, we are told it's OK to go outside so long as we are maintaining social distance from friends. If you go on a hike, we can be a little bit away. My understanding is that uh, uh, Italy and Singapore say don't even do that. But but we really feel that's pretty safe as long as we've got that social distance. Right. So we can be yeah, sure. Correct. All... If you go to a park yeah. and there's a big distance between you and another person, and you're walking in a park and the air is circulating. Uh, and you keep a distance, I think it'll be okay. But you know, you don't want to go to a bar where you're like right next to the next person, and that that will be a little bit dangerous. Great, yeah. yeah. Of course, bars are less available right now than they were a few days ago. Um, so, John, you mentioned that uh, just to get clear, you mentioned that most people who get this will have relatively mild symptoms. Some won't even know that they have it. Um, so, in that case, why are we so more, why are we so much more worried about coronavirus than they are with we are with the flu? Well. We're worried about more about the coronavirus than we are about the flu because of what uh, Dr. Wang was just saying. It had is where we are today 
and actually in your introduction, you said that as well, where we are today, in a week from now, we're gonna be a lot worse. In a week from there, we're gonna be a lot worse. We see where we are on the graph and we know where we're going unless we do something about it. Mm -hmm. So that's the real fear. Yeah, you know, uh, any time there's an epidemic, public health authorities have a, have a bit of a dilemma. They wanna make sure people take it seriously. They wanna make sure people don't, don't panic over it overall, right, overall too. And certainly there are some people who feel that we're going a little bit overboard and they point to the UK. The UK has made the decision to not close public schools at this point. They say, we don't think it's necessary. We know it's, there's some advantages to it, but there's a downside too. Kids would be at home. Parents would have to take care of the little kids. Some of those parents need to go out for their job, for their livelihood, or because they're essential workers. So we're not going to do that. So I guess the question is, uh, what do you say to the people who think that perhaps we're overreacting just a bit with the shelter in place? Right, I get that question a lot. And it's a fair question to ask. No matter what we choose to do, there will be trade-offs. If we choose to not take aggressive action right now, we have very good, very good data, very good projections where we will be in a month, two months, and three months. And that's not a place that anybody wants to be in. Mm -hmm. If we choose to not be aggressive right now, that's the consequence. If we choose to be aggressive right now, as Dr. Wang was just saying, we're going to stay below that level where we won't overwhelm our health system, where so many people won't die. You gave the statistics from the, the London projections just from a couple of days ago, and you saw what we could do. We could reduce it by half. Still really serious. The irony of all of this is if we're very successful, the people who were saying that we were overreacting will say we overreacted. Look, it wasn't much of a problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so one more, let me push this one more thing. The, that, that London report uh, had a number that, that uh, Vice President Pence, who's, who's the, the point person for the Trump administration on this crisis, repeated, which he said, we shouldn't gather with groups of more than 10 people. Do you think 10 is too many? Yeah, I think that um, we want to be as far away from people as we can be. Mm -hmm. um, not in terms of distance, six feet is fine, but just not being in groups of people. Every person you are, are next to within that six foot radius, you're taking a risk because you don't know whether they're infected or not and they could spread it to you. So the most prudent thing to do is to have the, limit your contact. Now, you know, we, it's not a binary issue here. Um, we can't be perfect with this. There are times when we may have to go to the grocery store. We may have to do other things but we want to decrease the number of times we encounter other people right now. That's what's going to bring this number down and stop this serious problem. Okay, so we have to take this seriously. We have to uh, make these restrictions part of our lives. Here's a question I hate to ask because I don't really want to hear the answer, and you may not be able to give me a good answer, but how long are we going to have to deal with these inconveniences? Well, um, I have sitting right in front of me a crystal ball, and it's going to give us the answer. Right. That's why we invited you. Right. <laughs> I wish I could answer that. We can look at some of the projections, though, and, and we can also look at the experience in other countries. For example, we saw in China how long it took to peak. And then, of course, there were very, very people have described as draconian measures to, to handle this, but we saw it drop also. We think that with a lot of the modeling, the suggestion is that we're going to reach our peak in around 45 days. That's a number that people are kicking around. But frankly, it's all a guess right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Jason, you're a pediatrician. And one bright spot, if we can call it that, is that it appears that, that children don't die from this disease. Uh, I assume they get infected in some way or other, but can they transmit it? And uh, what should we, how are we defining children? Is this kids under 10 we're talking about or 18 or infants or whatever? Yeah, so uh, so typically when we define children, we define you know less than 18 and within this group, uh, there are still children that are quite vulnerable, uh, children with chronic disease and this uh, make up 15% of children. Wow. And so, you know, kids with, with with asthma and other uh, chronic illnesses uh, needs to be very, very careful. So I wouldn't uh, completely say that children are free of risks. 
but most children are healthy. And so uh, when they are uh, infected with the virus, they might not have symptoms or they might have very mild symptoms, but they could still be harboring the virus and they could still transmit it to other people. And so uh, I think uh, trying to convince uh, kids to stay inside, uh, it, it's a challenge. You have to give them something to do or at least guide them through this process. Um, and, you know, I have two teen, teenage daughters. And so, uh, we know, it's a constant communication. And I think they listen to me a little bit more after this, they listen to me on radio. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's a constant debate on, you know, could I just hang out with one friend or could I just hang out with two friends? You know, what about if we go to this place versus that place? And uh, as Dr. Schwarzberg was, was, was saying earlier, you know, we try to make predictions of how long this would last, right? The more vigilant we are in social distancing, the quicker this will be over. Okay. So they say, you know, if you, if you could uh, limit contact and infecting other people, uh, then if we do it really well, it will be shorter. If we don't, it will start to spread again, and, and then it will linger. So it's, it's either you want a short-term, you know, sort of, you know, stay-at-home strategy and go out only for necessary things like getting your groceries or, you know, walk in the park when fewer people are there, or you want to, you know, basically have this linger. Well, so if I'm a parent of kids under 10, just to put a fine point in this, I gather since I may be able to social distance, but I can't really expect my six-year-old to probably no in-person play dates, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, they they could do play dates online, just like what we're doing right now with this program. Yes. Well, I'm having a wonderful time. I hope my six-year-old can do the same. <laughs> uh, so... John, what are the biggest unknowns about this virus and what are the biggest misconceptions that you can correct for us? Well, we were talking earlier about transmission and we need a lot more science to guide us in how this organism is is transmitted and how to intervene with that transmission. So that's a big unknown at this point, or at least we don't know enough. You know, from an epidemiologic standpoint, it's very frustrating that we really don't know how many people are infected with this virus in the United States right now. We have very, very poor data. The data is is really so bad that it it hampers not only in a conversation for, for us to tell you from public health to tell you what the mortality rate is, the case fatality rate is, um, what a lot of the risk factors are, because we just don't have that data. Um, So I would say that's a major area. And when we don't know exactly where the disease is distributed, because we don't have the data, we don't know how best to marshal our resources, where they should be focused. So these are all enormous problems. So I would put the epidemiologic issues without um, that are hampered by a lack of data and more information about transmission. Mm -hmm. From a clinical standpoint, our... our, um, physicians who are on the front lines with this, both emergency room doctors, hospitalists, and of course the intensivists, um, they're, they're getting a pretty good handle on how to treat this, but we still have a lot of fundamental questions. Um, what do we do about the tremendous inflammatory response by our immune system when we're infected in the lungs? Why does that happen? How best can we control that? A small percentage of people after their lungs have been attacked develop fibrosis, or that is scarring in their lungs, and that could lead to permanent lung damage. Why does why is it happening with this infectious disease? What can we do to prevent that? So these are some important clinical questions amongst certainly a lot more. Um, that said, again, I'll, I want to emphasize that our doctors are doing a fabulous job in treating these patients. And it sounds like one thing that we do know that's not in question is social distancing is the most important thing we can do, right? We know that. Yes. We absolutely know that. And we really think that washing your hands a lot is worthwhile. Absolutely. Great, great. Now, we haven't, uh, we don't know as much as we'd like to epidemiologically because the U.S. has been far behind on testing versus other countries. And there's reasons for that we don't have to go into right now. And certainly at this point, we're ramping up our testing rapidly. That'll be helpful from a big picture. We have a question from the audience, I think is an interesting one, which is a more individual. What's the point of being tested? if it doesn't change the medical plan of treatment? It's a wonderful question. 
Um, and a lot of people, I've, I've had so many people requesting to be tested because they have a little cough or a sore throat or just maybe cold symptoms and they're, they're worried. And I've told them, don't get tested because it's not going to change what we're going to do. So your the question in the audience, the question that was raised by our audience is a very appropriate one. On the other hand, I'm talking about the need for data in terms of the epidemiology of this disease, how it's distributed in our population, how extensive it is. And that's the reason we need to be testing to understand that. But from a clinical standpoint, you don't need to be tested necessarily. We're testing people who are very sick and we need to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, there's a number of questions here about vaccine. We've all heard there'll be, it'll be a year or more before a vaccine is available. Uh, fortunately, it's being worked on and there's a fair level of confidence we'll get something, but it's not a near-term assistance, right, overall. So then the question is, will there be any self-test kits for infection or you know, will we have um, a lot more information or a lot more opportunity to test uh, a lot sooner? We're going to get um, point of care testing, meaning like you're talking about self-care tests or, or kits, or at least where you'll be able to go into a, a doctor's office or some healthcare facility and, and get tested and get an answer very quickly within maybe 90 minutes or maybe even less. But that's off in the future. That's going to be months from now is my guess. Mm -hmm. So we can't look toward that. Um, on the other hand, we're going to, testing is really ramping up now and we're figuring out better ways to get people tested. Um, in our Bay Area, for example, there are lots of creative, creative things being done, including down at Stanford where Dr. Mm -hmm. Wang is. Um, so I think we'll, we'll, it, it's being facilitated. There, up in Seattle, there's a, a company that was uh, financed by the Gates Foundation that is looking at home testing. That is, if your doctor orders a test, they can get send you or bring you mm -hmm. the testing or send it right overnight, and you can test yourself, and then they'll come and pick it up from you. So I think we're going to see some very creative things being done in regards to testing. Um, but, you know, we just need to have enough tests available, and we still don't have it in spite of what our government's telling us. Yeah, we're well behind there too. Now we've heard that Italy, who which has about well more than thirty-one thousand cases of COVID nineteen, second only to China, actually worldwide, it's struggling greatly, and its healthcare system is really at the break. It's really being overwhelmed. It's at the breaking point, with um, hospitals not able to take care of everyone, not enough ventilators for people who really need ventilators, and uh, physicians and other health professionals and EMTs and other getting sick as well. So what can we do? This is really a question for both of you. Uh, what can we do to support the U.S. healthcare system and make sure we minimize the likelihood of it getting overtaxed? Jason, you want to start that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the, the, let me tell you what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. So I was in clinic yesterday and we look at the list of people who had booked appointments. So we started calling them and to assess their symptoms and why they want to come in. And, and then we document it in, in medical records, this conversation. And, and it turns out that 80% of the people don't need to come in. That, you know, we, we tell them, you know, what they should look out for and, you know, what medications they might want to, to take. And most of it is over the counter. And we tell them when to call us back. And then we establish a way to follow up with them. If we think that we should check up on them in a couple of days uh, to make sure their symptoms didn't get worse. So just by doing that, we are able to reduce 80% of the people who were planning to come in. And then, you know, we had uh, among those uh, that we had, you know, follow up for 20% of them. And so uh, we put our students uh, to work on residents, you know, the doctors in training to work on these things. And, and this is medicine. This is telemedicine. Mm -hmm. and, and so that way they learn how to take a history online. And more recently, the uh, U.S. government had relaxed the use of, you know, telecommunication uh, like phones. You could, you could do FaceTime or Skype or without breaking the, the HIPAA. Uh, uh, rules, and uh, you know, and this is under COVID nineteen temporarily that people want you to use uh, telecommunications uh, to reach out to patients. And so this way, if you could decrease the number of people coming in to the hospital or the clinic when they don't really need to, then you're going to decrease 
the infection rates because some of them are going to get infected while coming in. Some of them has it and, and will give it to other people. So we try to make it uh, in such a way that people are uh, reassured after we talk to them and, 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 and these are doctors that talk to them and, and we have a good record keeping. And so if we could just reserve the hospital to take care of very sick patients and don't have a lot of people mingling in the hospital, trying to find their way, uh, then I think we'll, we'll be able to uh, prevent a surge and, and, and from sort of overwhelming the hospital and the staff and, 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 and you know, all the you know, personal protective equipment that, that's needed to actually see a patient. Yeah, that's a, a great point. And I think that although many of us, when we have these kinds of concerns, are, are more desirous of wanting to see a doctor by expressing to people that A, most people who get this aren't going to get very sick, and B, the best way to get sick is to go to the doctor or the hospital, right? That's the most likely place to catch an infection. They may see the benefit to doing this uh, from afar remotely. John, you have any thoughts about yeah, and, this? And, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. And, and let me just add one more thing. So yeah. a lot of the, the, the parents thank me afterwards. Wonderful. They told me that they were really afraid to go into the hospital. So they are really happy that they don't have to. Yes. And that they're really happy that I call. And right. they're really happy that we're going to be checking up on them in a couple of days. True. And, and we have a plan. So uh, right now, people are also afraid. Terrific. Well, I hope our, our, our listeners uh, take this to heart. I certainly will. John? Sure. I, I, I really want to second what uh, Dr. Wang is saying about telemedicine. Um, I think the vast majority of people, um, would patients, would appreciate the ability to have better communication with their healthcare team, including their doctor. Mm -hmm. And telemedicine is a great way to do that. So, um, and this is a perfect time to be instituting it. So I'm delighted that we're starting to ramp up on this. Um, you had asked me earlier about some of the myths um, that I've been hearing. Um, and there are a lot of myths uh, going around um, that are, some of them are just astounding, but um, I get, I get questions about what kind of supplements should I be taking? Mm -hmm. And my answer is none. <laughs> um, uh, get a lot of questions or that uh, myths about the fact that, well, if I test negative, then I can't possibly uh, spread the, I can't possibly get sick and I can't spread this disease to anybody else. And the answer is, no, that's not true. You could test negative today and you still could be in the period where you're not producing enough RNA to detect and the next day you could be positive. Um, I've heard that if you, the, one, of the, one of the ones that is a frightening one, uh, the advocating that if you're sick and if you can hold your breath for 10 seconds, then you don't have to worry that you have COVID. That one just astounds me because it's so blatantly crazy, uh, but it seems to be very popular um, uh, as a myth. Um, needless to say, there's there are many, many more. And when we have a problem like this, people are reaching out and are desperate. Um, the best place, place to get your information about uh, this problem is not on social media. It's on something that has at the end of it, like the CDC.gov or an EDU at the end of the uh, of the link. Great, that's good to know. We have a very tactical question because a lot of, uh, for a couple of, of, of the audience members have asked a similar question that restaurants are closed, but delivery or takeout still okay. And is this a threat? Is food to go safe? What about the containers the food is in? You gotta eat, right? Uh, I'll, I'll start, but I'd, I'd love to hear Dr. Wang's opinion as well. Um, I think the risk of the containers is exceedingly small. You can even reduce it further if when food is delivered, you can wipe off the container. You know, one of the, if there's anything nice about this virus, if there's anything nice about this virus, besides the fact that it doesn't seem to make young children uh, Ill, terribly ill, um, is that it has this, its structure has this uh, envelope around it. Mm -hmm. And that envelope is, called a lipid envelope or fat. And it's, it's, it, to an extent, that's the virus's Achilles heel because it's very easy to destroy or damage uh, viral particles that have that em a lipid envelope. Um, so most any disinfectant, actually the best thing is soap and water, wiping off um, 
these containers, that should remove an adequate number of uh, particles. And of course, when, you, when you're handling the containers, the next thing you do before you do anything else is you put your hands under the water and you get lathered up with soap and you do it for at least 20 seconds. Great. Yes, I've heard that 20 seconds is uh, equivalent to singing happy birthday to you twice. And a friend of mine who said she's been doing this for three weeks every hour she thinks she's about 900 years old by now. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, there's a question about uh, the reliability of current testing. Once we do the test, are they pretty reliable? Or are there a lot of false positives or false negatives to worry about? I'll, 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 again, I'll jump in, but I'd love Dr. Wang's thoughts about this as well. Um, we, we can't answer that with precision at this point. Um, in terms of false positives, the test is very, very good at picking up the RNA of the virus. Um, so there probably are not a lot of false positives. There probably are quite a few false negatives, but when we say false negatives, we have to define what we're meaning. I mentioned earlier that um, after you're infected, there's going to be a period of time when you're not going to detect the virus. Mm -hmm. And so it will be negative, but it could become positive a day or two later. So it's not a true false negative, but it, well, it is a false negative. Yeah. It That's leads you down the, the thinking that you're not infected. So it, it's um, one of the caveats about testing. Um, we know from people who have been infected, have developed disease, COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, that they, they aren't always positive. So there are sometimes when we test these people, they are negative and we have to repeat it to see that it's positive. Mm -hmm. Great. Jason, anything else? Jason, to add to did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah. Well, I agree with everything Dr. Swarsberg just said. And I just wanted to add one more thing, which is the collection of the sample. So if you're getting the nasal pharyngeal swab and, you know, you, you need to get in there and it's very uncomfortable for the patient. Uh, sometimes they will throw up, sometimes they will sneeze, whatever, if you try to get something in their nose. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if people didn't get a good sample, then just go, you know, dab on it and, and, and come out and then they might get not enough, uh, you know, vi virus particles in here to, to actually... Uh, show up on a test. So you really also need to get a good sample mm -hmm. uh, in order to do a good test. Now, I know initially there was a big problem with the, the tests because America decided not to take the test that the World Health Organization developed, I believe, and then CDC had some, we had some problems creating our own test in H and CDC and so forth. So one question from the audience, uh, since now we have test, uh, our tests, is why can't we use the tests or duplicate the tests being used in other countries and is that not an issue anymore? Is it just simply a ramping up of manufacturing issue in testing? I don't know if either of you know the answer to that. Or it, I'll, I'll give it a stab. Um, right now, it's a ramping up of the testing. We, we have a test that we think is uh, reliable. Um, we had some problems in early February with its reliability, but we think the test is reliable now. Mm -hmm. It's really... a it's um, a challenge now to get enough testing, enough test material, and uh, enough laboratories on board and doing this test, and to do them rapidly. Um, some of the techniques to do the test are, are still too slow, um, but we have the technology to do them very rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, of concern, um, Dr. Wayne was talking about getting the right sample. Um, there's specific types of um, equipment that we use to get that sample list, uh, and we're running low on those. Um, some hospitals are now, instead of doing both through the mouth and through the nose, we're doing just one of the two because of the um, dearth of the equipment to get these samples. So that's a concern. Mm -hmm. There's also a concern about the um, uh, products that we need to make these tests. Um, there's there's uh, some concern as to the supply line and how good it will be. Mm -hmm. um, so those, these are some things that are hanging out there that keep, um, keep people like Dr. Wang and me up at night. I bet. I bet. Now, Dr. Wang, we've uh, heard some reports that frontline medical personnel not only are at risk, but there, there seems to be some reason to believe that they may be getting more intense cases, worse cases of this fire of COVID-19 than others and uh, when they do get sick. Do we, I don't know, how, how compelling is the evidence that's happening? And if so, uh, why do we think that's the case? 
But I don't know if uh, frontline healthcare workers are getting sort of the worst uh, symptoms or, 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 you know, if they catch the virus. Uh, however, they are overworked. So that's, that's the truth. Mm-hmm. So it may, it may be that uh, because they've been up all night for many days, uh, that once they catch the virus, that the body doesn't have as, as much reserves. But I, I'm not sure if I see evidence that they're getting, you know, worse symptoms uh, than other people. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't know any of that, the report, yeah. Do you feel like we've got the adequate um, equipment and procedures and policies in place to protect the healthcare workers pretty well from the virus? Well, I think uh, uh, individual hospitals are now ramping up uh, uh, to with their policies and procedures uh, to actually make it even clearer than what they had before, because you know they are always exceptions. And and just in clinic yesterday, you know, I had a patient who doesn't follow the 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 decision trees that we made. And I'm like, well, I can't find this person in this decision tree, so we have to modify it. And so we're always modifying it and become more precise. Now, the difficult situation now is going to be once we start running out of equipment, uh, such as the testing kits uh, to get the sample or, you know, protective gear. uh, And then we really have to triage and make really hard decisions on who could come in. Mm -hmm. And that that's going to be a very difficult decision because, you know, if you have the capacity to see, you know, 300 people and, you know, 2,000 people wants to get in, yeah. then that's going to be a really hard decision. Yeah, that, that will or would be. Uh, how likely do you think it will be that we will face those hard decisions on a widespread basis in the U.S. over the next several months? Yeah. So if everybody stays home, like what they're supposed to, we'll see a slowdown, then we're less likely to face that decision. Mm-hmm. If people relax and say, hey, I don't, I don't hear anything. I don't think it's spreading that fast. And they start to go out. Uh, and you know, within uh, against the government's uh, current recommendations, uh, then we'll see more spread. And so it's really something that is modifiable. Mm-hmm. And we and, and and you know, a lot of people now have internet at home. They could watch TV. They could surf the internet. They could do their homework. Uh, most most kids could do that. They could play video games. So we're talking about there's lots to do at home and keep the social distancing so we don't see the surge in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Great, great. Uh, switching tactic, topics. Uh, John, I, I recently read something about a recommendation from the World Health Organization that people who have any symptoms of COVID-19 shouldn't take ibuprofen. What do you know about that? I know it's what's called anecdotal evidence. By that, I mean somebody came up with that idea. They may have had a patient who took ibuprofen and got worse or had complications. And that's how that rumor started. The most honest answer to that observation is we don't know. Um, There's nothing that's been published in peer review literature to suggest that it's a problem. Certainly if somebody has intrinsic or intrinsic kidney disease, or has had bleeding ulcers, you would not want to be taking ibuprofen if they got COVID-19. But for somebody who's otherwise healthy, um, there's nothing that science knows that's a problem. Clearly, now that that question is out there, we do need to investigate it and find out. But there's a simple way to get around it, frankly. If Mm -hmm. the reason you'd be taking ibuprofen would be for the body aches and the fever, take acetaminophen. For example, Tylenol is one of the brands. That'll help you with your body aches and help you with the fever. And then you don't have to even address the ibuprofen issue. Great. Okay, thanks. Just to get clear on that, uh, the main brands of ibuprofen would be Advil or Motrin, something like that. And to get a cinnamon, would be Tylenol or Excedrin. I have those right? Great. Good. So, yeah, I was a little bit amused. The World Health Organization, of course, uh, recommended that people not self-medicate. But if your doctor prescribes it, it's OK. And it seems like what you're saying is your doctor's guess is as good as your own. But um, why not just use Tylenol instead? All right. OK, great. Thank you. Um, Jason, you know, I, I did a little research on pandemics uh, for this because I was saying, what, what are the other pandemics? And interesting to me, um, the last cholera epidemic, 1910 to 1911. 
Uh, I, I'm sure most of us don't remember that, but it's the sixth major cholera epidemic. Interesting, it killed over 800,000 people worldwide. Big epidemic, but in the U.S. it only killed 11. Not 11,000, 11. Amazing. And one of the main reasons they attribute that to is because our country had learned a lot from past epidemics and quickly isolated anybody who came into the country with cholera. Isn't that great? So we clearly didn't do that this time. I think anybody would say we simply didn't respond quickly enough. Why did we lose that lesson? And what can we do to try to retain the lessons we're learning now for future epidemics, which are almost certain to occur? Yeah. You know, that, that's a very good question. So um, this epidemic started in China and it, it seemed far away from us, from the United States. But in reality, it's 10 hours away by flight. And given how, how much people travel these days, you know, if somebody's sick in China or elsewhere in Asia, within 10, 12 hours, they're going to be, you know, in the West Coast of the United States, including Seattle and San Francisco. And that's what we're seeing here is that uh, when geographically it seems to be far away, but uh, because of the modes of transportation now that it could get to us very, very quickly. And so uh, because uh, influenza and, and other uh, sort of uh, epidemics uh, arise uh, quite frequently, because uh, we, we, we had SARS and then in the United States we, we had H1N1, and then there's avian flu also from Asia and MERS from the you know Mediterranean region, um, and 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 now you know COVID nineteen, so it, it could come from anywhere, and we have to be prepared. And so the best way to prevent uh, disasters from happening from an uh, epidemic is to prepare for the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have to deal with this one right now, uh, and then we have to be vigilant. And, yeah. and prepare for the next one. Yes. I could add to that um, important, those important words that Dr. Wang had to say. We talked earlier about preventing problems and when you prevent something, no one sees that you prevented it because it never occurred. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, in the United States, over the last three, even three and a half decades, we've been markedly underfunding public health. And it's accelerated in the last three years. That the consequences of that are what we're seeing right now. And that is we're not prepared. We don't have an, the people in public health are beautifully educated, very smart people, very capable and very dedicated. There's just not enough of them. Mm -hmm. We, I think most of the audience probably knows that the Pandemic Preparedness Center that the government had set up in anticipation of another pandemic was dismantled two years ago. So one of the ho hopeful lessons we will get from this pandemic is that we have to invest in the public's health. Mm -hmm. We can't cut back on that because we're not seeing a problem. You know, we spend a fortune in this country maintaining an enormous military that most of those people, the vast majority of, who, of whom aren't fighting anywhere, but we do it in anticipation of some problem in the future. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather see, of course, that money being put into the prevention of further pandemics mm -hmm. because we've always had pandemics and in the foreseeable future, we're going to continue to struggle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had several questions about medications. Are there medications that may be designed for another illness that might work against COVID-19, including specifically people said, how about the pneumonia vaccine? Anything we can take now to help prevent or treat uh, COVID-19? Well, we have um, the, the pneumonia vaccine is terribly important for people to get. Um, and the CDC recommendations are very clear about that. And that's because it can help prevent a secondary bacterial pneumonia from a specific bacterium that's pretty common cause of, of pneumonia. So I would urge anybody who is a candidate for that vaccine who hasn't gotten it to get that. It won't prevent COVID or it won't prevent getting infection with SARS-CoV-2, but it, it will help you not get a secondary bacterial infection. And you know, even though influenza appears to be starting ending our influenza season, if you haven't had the flu shot, get the flu shot. It'll help prevent influenza. Mm -hmm. And 
some of the more recent data that I've been seeing about um, uh, COVID disease, the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2, is that about 10 to 20 percent of people appear to be co-infected with influenza virus or another virus called metanumovirus or some other viruses. So there are about 10 to 20 percent of people have SARS-CoV-2 plus another virus, and you can protect your, yourself against that being influenza by getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I had a specific question from a friend that might, others might relate to. She, she has an 86-year-old mother who lives about 30 minutes away from her. This is in New York City and who lives by herself. And my friend, her daughter, is the main contact she has with the outside world. She used to have overnight care and a cleaning service, but both those were discontinued in the last week or two, okay, for, uh, for, because of the concerns about the virus. My friend now worries that she may now be infected. So what should she do? She's the support for her mother. And if she does test negative and feels like it's safe enough, her husband and son, adult son, just came in from the outside world sheltering in place as of yesterday. Should they wait? And if so, how long before they bring her into their house, which, by the way, only has one bathroom. So it's really hard to sort of quarantine one person there. So here's a real kind of a question, but I bet some of our listeners can relate to some aspects of it. Well, um, the question is, should, should I... Should I visit grandma, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I would say that whoever is taking care of grandma, mm -hmm. uh, if this person is also taking care of other grandmas, mm -hmm. so they're not just working in, in that one house, but they're going around different houses, mm -hmm. that's a higher risk than if it's just taking care of one grandma. Mm -hmm. And and so, uh, you know, we need to figure out a way to, to uh, screen and test people who are taking care of the elderly, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in nursing homes, to yep. make sure they don't have it and give it to elder, all the people in that institution. And for individual households, uh, you, you need to practice the same vigilance uh, and to make sure that there's no cross-contamination between different households. Uh, whether or not uh, to uh, uh, take somebody into the house uh, if you if they have been to Europe recently or other uh, or you know from China or other hotspots, uh, they could wait 14 days mm -hmm. to see if they have any symptoms. Uh, and if there's only one bathroom, uh, that means the house probably is not too big. Uh, unless you're in Palo Alto, three bedroom, one bathroom. That's yeah. Palo Alto. But yeah. elsewhere, usually have one, more than one bathroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, then um, then you need to stay a distance, even if you take them in. And so, but I would say, you know, wait for a little bit before visiting grandma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, there's a question about whether there's a risk of mutation of the coronavirus. Uh, could it get worse or would a mutation make it likely to be less potent? Do we know anything about that? The, the, the coronavirus is an RNA virus and RNA viruses are... Uh, notorious for developing mutations. Their fidelity when they reproduce is not particularly good. So we know that this virus is always mutating. It mutates several times in three days, for example. But the vast majority of those mutations have nothing to do with its ability to transmit or how it causes disease. To date, we've seen some different lineages of this virus since it became apparent. Um, there was there's some very preliminary work suggesting that there were originally two strains that caused human disease. One caused much more severe disease than the other, and the other one sort of dropped off. But that that work that came out of China needs confirmation. Um, so I I would say that what we've seen in terms of the genetic changes over time now suggest that it has not changed significantly. Mm -hmm. um, that there's nothing that we've seen so far that suggests that it's going to become much more aggressive, mm -hmm. or unfortunately, there's nothing to suggest that it's going to become much less aggressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, again, we'll have to we'll only know the absolute answer in retrospect. But I'm I'm um, somewhat encouraged by not seeing any kind of really bad changes with it. Okay, let's hope for the best there. Uh, we're coming down to just really the last two questions. And since there's two of you, I'm going to ask each of you the same question about that. We, you know, we've been really, I really want to thank you. We've been talking about some great 
issues and a lot of very practical things. But of course, this crisis also has a huge human emotional component to it overall. And unfortunately, at a time like this, just when we really need to be together and embracing each other, the best advice is stay away, all right? So what can we do? My question for you is what can we do as individuals to try to get ourselves and others through this crisis, which is not only medical, but clearly emotional? Jason, I'll start with you. Yeah, so, you know, even though we can't be physically together, you could still call people and get them on, you know, FaceTime or do social media, just like what we're doing now, we're communicating. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that, you know, for people who are isolated, feel that, that they need to be in touch with people, you could reach out to other people or you could, you know, try to call grandma, try to see grandma on Skype or FaceTime and all, all these other uh, technology uh, tools that, that, that we could do. Now, the other thing that, that I think we should do, because right now we're asking people to do quarantines mm -hmm. and so uh, or, or self uh, try to stay home. And a lot of people rush to the grocery store and try to get a lot of uh, you know items. And then it's very crowded in the grocery store. I think we, we should make sure that you could set hours like from eight to 10, only grandma and grandpa could come in and get the items. So they wouldn't be like rushing in with like, cr you know, crowded with other other people trying to get groceries. And, and so we, we have to protect the elderly, we have to protect the vulnerable, and that's, you know, be good citizens and try to do that. Great, thank you, Jason. John. Well, I'd agree with everything uh, Jason said. And um, the other th thing I'd add to that is go outside. You know, we talked about that earlier. Take walks. If you like to jog, go jogging. Um, just don't go outside and with large groups. Mm -hmm. Um, I think being in nature can really be helpful psychologically. Um, this is really a painful time, and your question is very apt. My my son and daughter-in-law are both physicians here in the Bay Area, and um, they have two little girls, young girls. And my wife and I, even though they live 10 minutes from us, we're not allowed in that house, and that's the right decision. Um, but we hope to take a walk with the girls maybe even later today, mm -hmm. but we'll stay six feet away. Terrific, great. That's great advice and thank you for both of that. We're all very concerned about polarization in our society, but this is really a time to put aside our difference and see if we can all pull together and support one another. Instead of spreading the virus, let's think about spreading kindness, connection and support. I really think it's the time to reach into ourselves for the best we have and to the best that Americans have overall. So I wanna thank Dr. John Swartzberg and Dr. C. Jason Wong for joining us today virtually at the Commonwealth Club program. Please visit us regularly at commonwealthclub.org, which has not only other programs on this series, but other virtual programs as well on other topics, and consider making a donation to support the club. So thank you again, I'm Mark Zitter, and now this virtual program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>